Hey y'all, I am back on my bullshit. Okay, so this video is going to be about all things Amazon. So even though I have been gone for a week, I am still getting correspondence from them. Immediate response required. Amazon negative UPT notice, which is unpaid time off. This is a notice from your Amazon HR team. Hi, Anna. You have a negative UPT balance and a case has been created. Please respond by tapping Create View HR Cases in the footer of your A to Z profile or reply to the email sent to your personnel email with the subject line Action Required Amazon Negative UPT Contact. I made a video about the uh, A to Z app, which is what it's talking about, the footer of your A to Z profile. I will link... Um, that video in the description below in case you're interested. We hope that you are safe and healthy. If you require support or are facing challenges, the HR Operations Center is available to provide appropriate resources. If you are in need of a leave of absence, call 1-888-892-7180 for assistance. If you do not plan to return to Amazon, I sure as hell don't. There is a way to resign in the A to Z app. At the bottom of the page, tap Thinking of Leaving Amazon, and we will move forward with submitting a resignation on your behalf. So something I found really interesting was um, I was talking to my friend about the Amazon robots and how they tip over, and I couldn't find any articles about it. But in the three weeks I was working there, our floor was shut down. We had to go to a different floor. Like five or six times, maybe even seven times because there was a robot spill on our floor. So it definitely happens and pretty regularly. So anyway, I went on the um, Amazon employee website and found an article that kind of covers it. And that's what we're going to be going over today. The quest to deploy autonomous robots within Amazon fulfillment centers. Every day at Amazon Fulfillment Centers, more than half a million robots assist with stocking inventory, filling orders, and sorting packages for delivery. These robots follow directions provided by cloud-based algorithms and navigate along a grid of encoded markers. Virtual and physical barriers restrict their interactions with people as well as where they can and cannot go. I mean, that's kind of true, but also very misleading. So, um... The AI staff, they are allowed to go on the robot floor because they have a sensor on their vests so that the robots can read it and know that they're there and not hit them. And um, stowers, packers, people like that who interact with robots, we're told, like, you can't reach your hand over into the AI field or anything. Like, if you drop a package and it accidentally goes into that section, you are not allowed to grab it because the robots are not going to know that you're there. And then obviously, I mean, they crash into each other too. So, I mean, not, not really uh, as restricted as this article is making it seem. This is the first instance of AI being used in autonomous mobility at Amazon, said Siddhartha Srinivasa, director of Amazon Robotics AI. Robots navigate their worlds in a way that distinguishes each object in it and with knowledge about how each object behaves. With this understanding updated in real time, the robots can safely navigate cluttered, dynamic environments. For now, these robots are deployed in a few fulfillment centers where they are performing a narrow set of tasks. Researchers are exploring how to integrate these robots seamlessly and safely with the established processes that Amazon Associates follow to fulfill millions of customer orders each day. Established processes like only AI can go on the um, robot floor and areas and, you know, not reaching into the robot areas. Again, not nearly as sophisticated as they make it seem. We don't develop technology for technology's sake, said Srinivasa. Well, no, yeah, you, you're doing this because there have been problems. If there hadn't been problems, why would you be fixing it? We want to develop technology with an end goal in mind of empowering our associates to perform their activities better and safer. If we don't integrate seamlessly end-to-end, -end, then people will not use our technology. 
About 10% of the items ordered from the Amazon store are too long, wide, or otherwise unwieldy to fit in pods or on conveyor belts in many Amazon fulfillment centers. Today, fulfillment center employees transport these oversized items across the fulfillment center with pulleys and forklifts, navigating the ever-shifting maze of pods, pallets, robots, and people. The goal is to have robots handle this sometimes awkward task. I mean, that doesn't even happen. We just overstuff the pods, which is probably why they have crashes. But when, like, your entire performance is based on your stow time, there's really no incentive to do things right. It, there's just an incentive to do things quickly. And then, like, if a pod comes to you overstuffed, you're not allowed to fix it. You're not allowed to pull anything out because then you're the last person who touched it and you're liable for it. So, like, you're taught basically to not correct the problems with overstuffing the pods. Then Cadlick Perception Lead for Amazon Robotics AI is leading the development of the AI for the new robots. This team has deployed the robots for preliminary testing as autonomous transports for non-conveyable items. To succeed, the robots need to be able to map their environment in real time and understand what's a stationary object and what's not, and use that information to make on-the-fly decisions about where to go and how to avoid collisions. Cough, cough, cough. Cough, cough. This is like the closest you're going to come to them admitting that this happens, by the way. But, uh, yeah. Why would they need to learn how to avoid collisions if it wasn't happening? It's just like Sid Rafa said earlier, that they don't just do things for the sake of it. They do it to make it more seamless. So if it was working well, they wouldn't need <laughs> to learn, or I mean, program the AIs on how to avoid collisions. Navigating through the, those dynamic spaces is one aspect of the challenge, she said. The other one is working in close proximity with humans. That has to do with first recognizing that this thing in front of you is a human and it might move. You might need to keep further distance from it to be safe. You might need to predict the direction the human is going. We humans learn about the objects in our environment and how to safely navigate around them through curiosity and trial and error along with the guidance of family, friends, and teachers. Catholic and his team use machine learning. The process begins with semantic understanding or scene comprehension based on data collected with the robot's cameras in LIDAR. I don't know what that is, and they do not elaborate. When the robot takes a picture of the world, it gets pixel values and depth measurements, explained Lionel. Gedglun, an Amazon Robotics AI machine learning applied scientist. So it knows at that distance there are points in space, an obstacle of some sort. But that is the only knowledge the robot has without semantic understanding. Semantic understanding, he continued, is about teaching the robot to define that point in space to determine if it belongs to a person, a pod, or a pillar or if it's a cable line across the floor, or a forklift, or another robot, or, you know, something that fell out of the pod and is now on the floor blocking it. When these labels are layered on top of the three-dimensional visual representation, the robot can then classify the point in space as stable or mobile and use that information to calculate the safest path to its destination. The navigation system does what we call semantically aware planning and navigation, said Srinivasa. The intuition is very simple. The way a robot moves around a trash can is probably going to be different from the way it navigates around a person or a precious asset. I like how it's precious asset and not precious person. Definitely lets you know where <laughs> their priorities lie. The only way the robot can know that is if it's able to identify, oh, that's the trash can or that's the person, and that's what our AI is able to do. To teach the robot semantics, scientists collected thousands of images taken by the robots as they navigated. Then teams trace the shape of each object in each image and label it. Data scientists use this labeled data to train a machine learning model that segments and labels each object in the camera's field of view, a process known as semantic segmentation. Layered on top of the semantic understanding are predictive models that teach the robot how to treat each object detected. 
When it detects a pillar, for example, it knows that pillars are static and will always be there. The team is working on another model to predict the paths of people's robot encounters and adjust course accordingly. Our work is improving the representation of static obstacles in the present, as well as starting to model the near future of where the dynamic obstacles are going to be, said Gu Guen. Cadlick and his team have deployed a few dozen robots for preliminary testing and refinement at a few fulfillment centers. There they are moving packages, collecting more data, and delivering insights to the science team on how to improve the real-world performance. It's really exciting, Cadlick said. We can see the future scale that we want to be operating at. We see a clear path to being successful. Once Cadlick and his colleagues succeed in the full-scale deployment of autonomous mobile robot fleets that can transport precious, oversized packages, they can apply the learning to additional robots. The particular problem we're going after right now is pretty narrow, but the capability is very general, Cadlick said. Which is a nice way of saying we're not going to say that our robots are crashing into each other or possibly hitting humans, but yeah, no, we're working on it. Among the challenges of deploying free roaming robots in Amazon fulfillment centers is making them acceptable to associates, Srinivasa noted. If the robot sneaks up on you really fast and hits the brake a millimeter before it touches you, that might be functionally safe, but not necessarily acceptable behavior, he said. And so there's an interesting question around how do you generate behavior that is not only safe and fluent, but also acceptable. Okay, that is a very specific example. It makes me think that it has to have happened at least once. That has to be just terrifying, this giant pod with thousands of pounds of supplies on it going 20 miles an hour toward you and stopping right before it hits you. Like, that's terrifying. We are writing the book of robotics at Amazon, he said, noting that it's an ongoing process. One of the joys of being in a place like Amazon is that we have direct access to and direct contact with our end users. We get to talk to our associates and ask them, how do you feel about this? That internal customer feedback is critical to our development process. All right, now a cute little fact. Did you know our global selling partners, the majority of which are small and medium-sized businesses, have sold 7,400 products per minute in Amazon stores. Should definitely be paying the employees more. Amazon rolls out cool new video stations at over 200 sites to teach employees sign language. Definitely was not at my location, Den 4 in Colorado Springs. That would have been tight. Would have been nice to learn something there. Besides, you know, how to stow 310 items an hour. Alright guys, that's it for this video. I will be back next time with Amazon Part 2 about how their upskilling training is really just re-education for employees who are not meeting the ridiculous standards that are being set. Alright, there is a link to tip in the description as well as a link to the video I was mentioning before about the A to Z Amazon employee app. Please like, sub, and share. Please and thank you. I will see you next time. Bye!